If we'll, let's uh, all open our Bibles to 2 Samuel. Uh, we're, of course, in chapter 23, and we're going to be in verse 13 beginning tonight. And this is our last lesson in the series on uh, David's mighty men. Of course, it's not the end of the story of David, but it is uh, the last part of this section. And uh, it's been, I know it's been for me, uh, an encouraging study to look at these men and the great example that they set in their courage and their boldness and their devotion to their king and, of course, especially to God and the wonderful things that they accomplished with God's help. And I hope that our study tonight will really kind of be the icing on the cake and kind of bring it all together and, and show us uh, what these men were all about and some uh, great lessons that we need to learn from them. So um, we've talked about the, the mighty men who are mentioned, those who are called by name, there's one other whose name is not given, and we really don't know who he is or anything about him or why uh, he's not named, and people speculate and, and whatever. Uh, but there's one story that is, is given here in the text in connection with the mighty men that may include this unnamed warrior. And uh, we're going to look at that story for our study tonight to learn a lesson about loyalty, to talk about the loyalty of David's mighty men. So in verse 13... The Bible says, And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam, and the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephaim. So when we read that uh, statement, it takes us back to chapter 5 of 2 Samuel. And this is right after David was made king over Israel. The Philistines launched uh, an invasion and an attack trying to get to David. So obviously they had a, a healthy respect of him. They had known of him, of course, throughout his time in hiding in the wilderness and even among them. Uh, they knew his defeat of Goliath and, and the kind of soldier that he was. And now that he's been made king of Israel, this doesn't bode well for the Philistines. So they want to, if at all possible, to, to stop his reign as soon as possible. And so the Philistines come into the land, and they, they take over and encamp here in this valley of, uh, of Rephaim. So this is early in David's reign, and during this time, we still have people coming out to join together with him to, to stand behind him and, and to fight against uh, his enemies. And here we're told that there were three men, these are three of the mighty men, who, who come down to, uh, to meet with David. So he's hiding in the cave of Adullam, and we read about this as a, a stronghold, a, a fortress of David that he uses off and on as he is uh, out in the wilderness and hiding from Saul and so forth. And so that's where he is when these men come to him. Now, in the account over in 1 Chronicles 11, verse 19 says, These things did these three mightiest. And because it says mightiest, uh, sometimes it's assumed that this is talking about the first three of David's mighty men, those who were, were the first triad. Uh, so Adino and uh, the, the Eleazar, and what was the other one? Shama, I think his name was. So that was the first three, and some assume that that's who we're talking about here. But the text actually, the way that it's worded, and, and it doesn't use the article here in relation to them, it seems to be saying that we have the story of the first three, and then this story is meant to introduce us to the second three. And so that's why we think it may include this one who is unnamed. And whether it does or not, it, it doesn't really matter. It may have just been three of the other mighty men of David. We can't know for sure. But the lesson of the story is the same. And it's meant to demonstrate to us the loyalty that these men uh, had, had to David. So let's talk about what happens here. In verse 14, the Bible says that David was then in an hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. 
And so we're being introduced to these mighty men, and again, it seems like that second group of three with this brave and heroic act uh, that they did. And the bravery of it and the boldness of it is, is important, but more than that, what's really important is the, the devotion and the love and the friendship that they are demonstrating to David. And so we want to focus in on that and think about it. So David, of course, is he's been on the run for a long time. Uh, all through the end of Saul's reign, he'd been hiding from him and hiding in the wilderness. We know that he grew up in the town of Bethlehem. And so when he talks about uh, drinking from, from the water of the well at Bethlehem, uh, we can imagine him thinking back to his youth and to his childhood and how many times he must have stopped there for a drink of, of that water. And so he knew the water, he knew the well was good, and, and it was of good water. And there you know, are documents that kind of indicate that, that in Bethlehem, that there was good water in the well. And here's David hiding in the wilderness, having to, to fortify himself in a cave, and it appears to be the dry season. Because if it was the rainy season, you could just drink from, you know, a creek or a river or whatever. But they're having to go to wells to get water. So it's hot and it's dry. And David has been on the run and he's finally been made king. And he's not able yet to reign as he would like to as king. And in his, his weariness over the situation, he longs just for a drink of that good, cool, clean water from Bethlehem that he remembers from his childhood. So we learn from this that, of course, David is uh, human, like all of us, and he's facing a difficult situation. It indicates to us the time of year that it was. It indicates, you know, the, the situation that they were in. But it also indicates the seriousness of uh, the Philistine army being encamped in this part of the region. They had control over Bethlehem. And, you know, when you look on a, on a map, Bethlehem is not that far from Jerusalem. The first thing David did when he became king was to conquer Jerusalem, but he's not at Jerusalem now. He's had to leave to come to this cave to hide because the Philistines are coming in. So things don't look very good, and David is kind of, I say discouraged. Maybe he's not discouraged, but the, the situation is weighing upon him. And so these three men hear his request for this water, and, and David was not giving out orders. You know, he's not that kind of king who says, uh, I want water from Bethlehem, and I don't care what it costs, somebody go and get it for me. He's just wishing that he had a drink of that water, and he says it out loud. And they hear him, and they take it upon themselves. They don't even tell him what they're doing. They just leave, and they go to, uh, to get this water for their king, purely out of loyalty and devotion and respect for him. So when they hear him make this, this wish, and again, just kind of out loud, not necessarily to anybody in particular, they decide they're going to go and get him a drink of water from Bethlehem. Now, in order to do that, the Bible says that uh, they had to break through the host of the Philistines and then, of course, draw water out of the well and then make it back. So when we think of the cave of Adullam and where it was located in relation to Bethlehem, it's a distance of around 15 miles, uh, give or take. And of course, it's hilly terrain, so they could have traveled you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 miles through enemy territory, always under threat of being found out and being attacked in order to get to this well just to get David a drink of water. And when the Bible says that they broke through the, the, the camp, the idea of that word broke is it's just that. It means to cut through or to cleave. So it seems to indicate that there was fighting involved uh, when they were either when they were going or when they were coming back. So it wasn't necessarily just an easy trip. And the point to all that is that it emphasizes the great risk that they faced, the danger and the threat to their lives all for a drink of water for their king because they cared about him that much. So they did these things and they brought it back to David. Now, before we go on to the rest of the story, I want to take a moment and talk about what this teaches us about true friendship and about true loyalty and, and true devotion. There are some things that are involved here that we need to remember. First of all, in verse number 13, we understand that in, in true friendship to another, there has to be freedom. 
And here's what we mean by that. The Bible says that there came down, they went down to David, three of these uh, 30 chief, these 30 captains. No one sent out an order. You know, there wasn't a draft in the land of Israel that you had to join the army or, you know, there would be consequences. No one forced them to come to find David. They came of their own free will. It was their decision to come to find him. It was their decision to stand with him. It was their decision to make this treacherous journey to get him water from the well at Bethlehem. They weren't forced to do any of it. And that's important in connection with this kind of relationship. There has to be freedom. If a person is coerced into doing something, then what they do is not really a statement of loyalty or of devotion or of love. Rather, it's just... You know, they had to do it because they had to do it. And that's not what friendship and fellowship is about. Secondly, there's devotion. Verse 14 says that David was then in a hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. You see, they were devoted to David so much so that they would stand with him no matter what. If it, if it were David in Jerusalem on the throne of the palace, fine. But if David had to hide out in a cave in the middle of nowhere they would still stand with David. If it was during a time of peace and prosperity when everyone was doing well and there was no danger and no war, that would be great. But if the Philistines were all throughout the land and there was constantly that threat, they would still stand with David. That's the kind of devotion that they had. And again, that's what true loyalty, true friendship is about. Freedom, it's a free choice but it's a, a choice of devotion. They would stand for one another no matter what. And then thirdly, in the next verse, verse 15, we see there's honesty. When David says, in the Bible says that he longed and said, oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate, it indicates to us that David was not afraid, he was not unashamed to express his needs. And the idea is that David was maybe not in the best mindset because of all of the negative things that were happening but that was okay because you can tell your friends when you're in that kind of situation and if he wanted the water from Bethlehem he didn't care to say it because his friends would understood understand what he meant and so he was honest with them and this is important to understand because David is the king so to, to have this kind of loyalty uh, among his followers and those who serve him, David is showing them that he is one of them. He, he's not above them, even though he's king and they're not. He's just one of them. He's a soldier. He's, he's fighting the same fight. He faces the same threats and, and all of those things. And so he's being honest and open with them. And that, of course, helps to establish the friendship and the relationship. Then their sacrifice in verse 16, which of course is what these men did, of their own free will, they of course uh, made this great sacrifice to go and uh, fetch this water for, for David. And so that's another part of loyalty, another part of friendship, is being willing to sacrifice for another. Another is in need and we can help them. We do whatever we must in order to, to, to help, to, to do that for them. And then there's respect in verse 17 where David wouldn't drink what they brought him, but instead um, recognized the great uh, price that they had paid uh, in order to do that. So he honored them for what they had done. He respected the sacrifice they had made, and he showed them honor uh, for, for this great offering that they had brought to him. And he did that by turning around and offering it to the Lord. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But you think about these characteristics, freedom, devotion, honesty, sacrifice, and respect. All of those come together to make true friends. And that's what was needed in the land of Israel for the king to have people who were loyal to him so they could accomplish what God wanted to be accomplished. And we need the same kind of thing in the Lord's church. If we're going to be the people of God and the family of God, we have to treat each other as family. We need to know that we're, we're there for one another, you know, that somebody has my back and I have your back and we're in this fight together and we're willing to sacrifice and to risk and, and do all these things in order to, to be the people of God. But ultimately what it reminds us of, of course, is John 15 and verse 13. Jesus says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
And he goes on to say that you are my friends if you keep my commandments. Christ wants to be our friend. And when you think about friendship, so often we think about friendships in this life which come and go, which sometimes prove themselves not to be true and there's no loyalty. This kind of friendship is what is demonstrated with David and his mighty men. Christ is our king and he is loyal to us and he wants us in turn to be loyal to him. That's the kind of friendship that he offers us. There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, the book of Proverbs says, and that friend ultimately is Jesus. He's always there for us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He'll never betray us or turn against us. And everything that he does is for our best and our best interest. And so we need to remember that and, and learn these principles and apply them in our lives to be this kind of person in our relationships with others, but especially in our relationship with our Lord, with our King, that we're as loyal to him as these men were to David. Now let's talk just a little bit about what David did after they brought this gift to him. And sometimes people read this and, and they get upset that these men went through all of this trouble and faced all this danger and they brought David this water and he just poured it out on the ground is how they see it. Uh, he wasn't very grateful or, or thankful. But that's not really what happened uh, at all. The Bible says, and I want to notice again the end of verse 16, he says that nevertheless he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. There's a difference between pouring something out and pouring it out unto the Lord. Uh, this is the phrase that's actually for an, an oblation to God. This is a drink offering. So you remember under the Old Testament there were different kinds of sacrifices. There were, of course, animal sacrifices, blood sacrifices. There were grain offerings, uh, wave offerings, they're called sometimes. But there are also drink offerings. And so what David does is not a sign of disrespect to his friends for what they had done for, for him. It's not heartlessness that David, uh, that he's the king and he's decided he doesn't want this water now, so he just pours it out. That's not what's happening at all. Instead, number one, it's showing the humility of the new king of Israel, that he didn't see himself as worthy of them risking their lives just to bring him a drink of water. Now, how many kings do we know who have that kind of attitude toward their subjects? Kings are always about sending people off to war for, you know, the, the most flippant of reasons. But that's not the king of Israel here. That's not King David, and that's certainly not King Jesus. He didn't see himself worthy of them doing this for him. That doesn't mean he didn't appreciate it and he wasn't respectful of it, but he recognized the great price that they had paid and offering that they had made. And so instead, verse 17, when he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this, is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? When he ties this offering, this, this water that's been brought to him, to their blood, David sees this as just that, an offering, a sacrifice. These men risked their lives, their blood, to bring this to me, and I am not worthy of that. And so it was bought with blood. And the only thing David could do with it is to see it as holy, and something holy belongs to God. And so that's what he did. He didn't just pour it out, but he offered it up unto the Lord. He took their gift and turned it into a sacrifice for God. Now there's an important lesson to learn there, a powerful lesson that David is teaching to them and also to us. What he's showing is that they risked their lives to serve and to honor their king, but David is a servant of God. And so anything that they do to honor him, David is going to use it to honor God. And so he's showing those people who are following him and you know looking at his leadership and his example that whatever you do for me, I'm going to use it to serve God and to honor him. So by serving me, you're serving God. By honoring me, you're honoring God. And, and that was David putting himself in the place of God, obviously, but it's showing them that this is what's most important to David. He cared more about God being honored as the true king of Israel than David being honored, even by this tremendous sacrifice that his friends had made. 
And so again, he's unique as a king in history in general, but especially in the history of Israel. You don't read about many other kings who had this kind of attitude toward God. They wanted glory for themselves. You think about the reign of Saul that they had just come through, and this was a man who had abandoned God and was doing things his way for his own name and his own honor and his own glory. And here you have men fiercely loyal to David and everything that they do for him, he turns around and gives it to God. That's the kind of person you can follow. That's the kind of man, you know, that, that you'll fight to the death for. You'll lay your life down for this man because you know where his heart is and you know where he's going to lead you and that he's always going to take you in the right direction because he's headed toward God. And those are the kinds of leaders that we need in our world, but especially in the Lord's church. And so David honors them by taking their gift and making it a sacrifice to God. So he didn't just pour it out as though it wasn't important, but he makes it a sacrifice to God. And what better thing can you do with something that someone gives you than to use it in service to God and to honor God? It takes whatever it is that someone you know, has given to you and it elevates that even higher. It may have been a, you know, a, a wonderful gift that, that someone sacrificed to give you, and then if you turn around and use that to, to teach someone the gospel and a soul is saved for all eternity, then that gift has just you know, multiplied in its value. And that's what we need to do with all the things that we have in life, all the blessings that God gives us, all the things that are brought into our lives and under our control. We are to be stewards and to use those things to honor and to glorify God. And that only comes when we have our hearts in the place that David had his, to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. Now, as we think about this kind of story that, that is meant to illustrate the loyalty of these mighty men, it teaches us another important lesson. As we look back over the six mighty men who are named, five who are named, uh, and then the, the unman named, which we're kind of illustrating here, We've learned that God expects us to act, that being a servant of God, to be a mighty man or a mighty woman in his service is not just about what we say. It's not about what we think or what's in our hearts and what we believe, but it's about what we do. We have to be active. So we studied about the man named Adino, and we studied and learned that he killed 800 men with one spear, and that teaches us to do bold things. He had very little, but he accomplished great things with that little that he possessed. And we need to have that same attitude of boldness. We may possess little, but little is much in the hands of God. So we need to be bold and do bold things. Eleazar taught us to do exhausting things. Remember that he fought and kept on fighting until his arm was so exhausted that the sword was clenched in his hand. He, he couldn't even open his hand. He kept fighting until he couldn't fight any longer. And that teaches us to wear ourselves out in the service of the Lord, to never give up. Do we get tired? Do we grow weary? Of course we do. But we have to keep on fighting and keep on serving, even to the point of exhaustion, because of who our king is. So Eliezer shows us that. Shammah showed us to do right things. He fought to defend that field. He stood his ground, and he wasn't going to let the Philistines take the food away from the mouths of you know, the children of Israel, literally children, but also the, the inhabitants of the land. It was the right thing to do, and so he stood his ground, and he would not be moved. If we're going to serve God and be mighty in his service, we have to do the right things and take our stand and not be moved from what is right. Abishai teaches us to do humble things. The Bible says that he was great, but not the greatest. So he killed some men with the spear also, not 800 like a dino, only 300. He did a great thing, but it wasn't as great as, as others had done. But that didn't matter to him. He didn't have to be the greatest. He only had to do what he could with what he had. And so he was humble in his service. And God wants us to do great things and, and to do humble things, not to seek glory for ourselves, but for him. And then there was Benaniah who did difficult things. And he teaches us that we, if we're going to serve God and be mighty in his service, we must do 
difficult things. He fought lion-like men. He fought a lion in a pit in the snow. All those things that he did were not easy to accomplish, but he committed himself to the work, and he did those things. He won the victory doing difficult things. There are lots of things as we serve the Lord that are not easy to do, but if we truly love him, we'll do that even when it's difficult. And then this story of the mighty men tells us to do extravagant things. And I really want us to think about this and, and, and try to drive this point home because it's so important to understand that these men did something extravagant for David. They, they left safety and put their lives on the line just to get David a drink of water. That's kind of over the top. You know, if you want to show someone that you care about them, I mean, this is the way to do it, to risk your, your very life just to get a drink of water because they like the water from this well. No one told you to. You didn't have to do it. You just had the opportunity, and you knew that it would please your king, and so you risked your life to do it. That's extravagance to the extreme, and it teaches us that to be mighty in God's service we need to do extravagant things for him without being asked. You know, sometimes when it comes to our service to God, we do what we do because what well, God tells us to. You know, God said, I have to, and if I don't, I'm going to be in trouble. He's going to be mad at me. I might be punished. You know, hell is, is there for those who don't obey God. And so we do it, but we just do it because we have to. We feel like we're being forced to. Remember when we were talking about uh, this relationship, this friendship that existed, the first thing that, that we noticed in connection with it was freedom, that they did what they did of their own free will. And God created us as beings with free will. He could have, if he wanted robots to just automatically obey him, he could have created, you know, people that are like robots. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted people who would see him as he is and love him. And because they loved him, they would make the free will choice and decision to serve him. It's, it's a free will choice. And that's what it has to be. Now, because in order for something to truly be love, it has to come out of freedom there's also the fact that we have the freedom to choose to do the wrong thing, the freedom to choose to reject God, to not love him, and, and on and on. That's the risk of, of having free will. But God has revealed himself in such a way that he demonstrates to us his extravagant love for us in order to motivate our love for him. And our love for him needs to come out of freedom, and it needs to be extravagant, okay? So you buy your wife that ring, that necklace, that piece of jewelry. It doesn't serve any function. There's no reason for it, but why do you do it? Because you love her, because you know she likes it, she wants it. Maybe she's mentioned that that was a beautiful piece of jewelry. And so no matter how much it costs, you save up the money and, and you buy it. It's just an act of extravagance, okay? That's what these men did for David. They didn't have to. No one made them. David would have been fine if he didn't get a drink of water from Bethlehem. He didn't even drink it anyway. But this was something they knew that he wanted. It would allow them to demonstrate their loyalty and their love for their king. And so they did it no matter the cost. And that's what God wants us to do for him. Now, think about some examples. Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. We've mentioned this passage several times in studying the mighty men. And it's a mighty woman. She was a widow and she had two mites. And she gave those two mites to the Lord. And verse 44 of Mark 12, Jesus says that she cast in all that she had, even all her living. And we look at that story and we say it's just two mites. It wasn't that much, but to her, it was everything. That was an extravagant gift because she has no more money in her pocket. There's nothing else for her to use to buy food or clothing or whatever. She gave it all to the Lord. That is extravagance. You remember in uh, chapter 10 of Mark, 
when Jesus was uh, talking to that rich young ruler, verse 21, he says to him, or the Bible says that Jesus beholding him loved him and said, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And we know that he left, verse 22 says that he was sad and went away grieved for he had great possessions. And you know what we do? We read that passage and we say, well, Jesus was asking a lot of this man because he had all of this money and Jesus told him to, to get rid of all of it, sell everything that he had and give it to the poor. What a, a tremendous sacrifice he was required to make. And then we look at the widow with her two mites and we say, well, that's not that big a deal. But for both of these individuals, it's their entire living, all of their money, all of their livelihood. Why is it worse for one than the other? The truth is it's not. It takes the same amount of faith you know, to do one as it does the other. But we get focused on the amount and, and we forget the nature of faith and the nature of the sacrifice. But suppose that this man had done what Jesus said and sold everything that he had and gave it to the poor. Do you think that the Lord would have abandoned him and that he would have gone into poverty in the poor house and never been able to, to you know, eat and have clothing? Of course not. The Lord would have provided for him and taken care of him, but he didn't have the faith to do it. The Lord asked of him something extravagant, and he wasn't willing to make that sacrifice. Well, David's mighty men were even without being asked. In Mark chapter 14, we have another example. Notice this in beginning in verse number uh, 3. The Bible says, In being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he sat at meat. There came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. So you think about what happens here. She has this, this box, this jar, container of this ointment. And so it's like perfume. It's, it's very costly, very price, uh, price, pricely. It's precious, the Bible says. They even talk about you could have sold it for 300 pence and used this money to do these good things and these good works. But she takes that box of expensive perfume and breaks it open and anoints Jesus with it. Now, think about it. How long is that smell going to, to stay on the Lord? The world that they lived in, right, where you're outside and you walk around in sandals and, you know, there's no cleanliness like we think of today. You, you don't have soap like we have today. You don't, didn't have deodorant. How long is the Lord going to smell good from that ointment? It's not going to last very long. It seems pointless. Why do it? Because it was an act of extravagance. Because she loved the Lord and he deserved the best that she had to offer. Jesus says about her, let her alone, in verse 6. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor with you always, and whensoever ye will, ye may do them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. You know, the Bible tells us in John chapter 20, there were many things that Jesus did that are not recorded in the scripture. In fact, there's so many things that, you know, John said the, the world couldn't contain the books of all that he did. Many things that Jesus did, good works that are not recorded, but this woman's deed is recorded. And he says, wherever the gospel is preached, you're going to talk about this woman. Why? What's so important about her? Because she gave extravagantly to the Lord. She didn't have to. She could have taken that perfume and kept it for herself. She could have given it to a, a friend. She could have sold it and had the money for herself. They could have done any number of things with it, but she broke it open and she wasted it on the Lord. Now, it wasn't a waste, but it seemed wasteful. It's extravagance because he deserved it because of who he is. She loved him more than anything else, more than her money, more than her perfume, more than what anyone said or thought about her. He came first, and she demonstrated it with this extravagant gift. Now think about Philippians 3, 
verses 4 through 8 and the Apostle Paul. What did Paul do that was extravagant for the Lord? He talks about in the book of Philippians who he was and all that he had before he became a Christian. And here's what he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And then he says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul said, everything that I have is over here, and if you tried to tally it up, it it would amount to a lot from a human perspective. Position and power and political influence and money and wealth and all of these things. Paul said, I had it. I had it all, and I gave every bit of it away in order to have Christ. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ. What was excellent to Paul was not material things and not the uh, appeal to men or the praise of men, but to know Christ. And so he said, I didn't just do that when on the road to Damascus I saw that vision and I was told what I needed to do to be saved. It wasn't just a one-time action. He said, I continue to count everything that I have as nothing. In fact, he says, I count it as dung. And you can do some research on that word and understand what it means. And Paul says, that's what everything in this world is when it comes to Christ. I will give up everything. He would give his life, his body, and, and ultimately give it in sacrifice, he would die for Christ, purely out of extravagance, because the Lord deserves it. Now here's the question, when's the last time that I did something extravagant for God? We sometimes think it's a hassle to attend the worship service. You know, and preachers have to preach sermons trying to guilt people into being faithful in attendance, in, into increasing our contribution, into you know, just the basic things that we do to to keep the services of the church working and functioning, doing the work that God wants us to do. And so we, we do it sometimes out of guilt and we do it sometimes out of fear. When do we do it just out of love? That God doesn't have to ask. We don't have to be guilted into doing it. We just, out of a sense of love and devotion to Him, give extravagantly to Him. Think about honestly, look at your life and ask, what's the greatest thing that you've ever sacrificed for the Lord? What's the biggest thing you've ever done for Him? What are the great things and the big things and the extravagant things that you could do now, but something is holding you back from doing them? And I say that because if we want to be mighty soldiers, it's about being brave and bold and courageous and standing for the truth. But it has to come from a heart of love and devotion to God. That he deserves my boldness and my bravery and and my courage. I I ultimately am, am the one who benefits from all of that. I receive the blessings and God does great things for me and through me. But I do it because he deserves it. Is there some person I need to talk to about the gospel and I keep putting it off and making excuses why I shouldn't because I'm not comfortable and I'm scared and and whatever? Do something extravagant for the Lord. Have that conversation. Is there some uh, material thing, monetary gift that I can give to the Lord and I haven't done it? I need to be extravagant in my service to God just because He is worthy of it. Not for someone to pat me on the back to say what what a good person I am. No one else even has to know about it. But God knows. And that's the point of David's mighty men. They did these amazing, bold, and brave, and courageous things. But they did it because they loved their king. And we need to love our Lord, our king, the same way that we'll do these same kinds of things for him. We need to be willing to sacrifice extravagantly to serve our Lord, to give ourselves, to give our lives to Him completely and wholeheartedly just because for no other reason than He deserves it, He is worthy.
So I hope we'll think about it and take it with us and really ponder over those things. But I want us to close by summing up the whole story here of David's mighty men by looking at two things at the end of this chapter. Well, one at the beginning and then at the end. When you read verses 24 through 39 of uh, 2 Samuel 23, you have the list of all the other mighty men. And there are more mentioned in 1 Chronicles 11. And when we read through that list of names, we understand that even if you weren't one of the elite six that are, you know, their deeds are recorded, you were still on the list. And so David knew his mighty men, and he knew them by name. He knew the deeds of, of these you know, top six that are recorded, but he also knew what the others had done. And we need to remember that 2 Timothy 2, 9 says, The Lord knoweth them that are his. God knows us. We're on the list if we're one of his mighty servants. And man may not know us. Our may, name may not be in lights. It may not be recorded for history. You know, it may not be passed on some great deed that we did. But God knows what we've done. And if we're serving him, then God knows and so as we read and we study these, these men and we see their names, we're reminded that God knows those who serve him. But I also want to take just a moment and with a little bit of sadness, notice the last name on the list. The very last verse, the very last name in verse 39 is Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite was the husband of Bathsheba. And he's the man who, after David committed adultery with her and she became pregnant, uh, David had him killed. When we think about David and that story of, of his sin and how bad it was, understand that one of the men or the man that he murdered was one of his mighty men. That breaks my heart. These, these men who were the closest to him, who had been loyal to him and fought all these battles, it was one of them that he betrayed to his death. And that, of course, brings us to the next part of the study, which we're going to talk about uh, David's sin with Bathsheba. But just keep that in mind as we get to that, to get to that story. And then lastly, notice verse number one. We hadn't read this yet because we were just focusing in on the mighty men. But the chapter begins, now these be the last words of David. So what's recorded in this chapter is, is David's final speech to the nation of Israel before he died. Not the very last thing that he said, but his last national proclamation, if you will, to, to the people. And it's significant that in his last words to the nation, he wanted them to know the men who were loyal to him. That's how important these men were to David. Before he died, he wanted everyone to know the ones who had stood by his side from the beginning and been faithful and loyal servants. So you see this friendship that they had, this fellowship that had developed among them, their devoted service to him as king, it had made them more than a king and servants. They were as close as family. And David wanted their names remembered on the record for all of history because of their faithfulness to him. In Matthew 10 and verse 32, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men... Him will I confess also before my Father who is in heaven. Just as David confessed to the world, these are the men who are loyal to me, there is a day coming when Christ will confess those who are loyal to him to his Father in heaven. And the ones who will have their names confessed to God are those who are the mighty men and women who are servants of Christ. Those who confess him. And that doesn't just mean when we make the good confession. It means that every day as we live, we confess Christ in our lives, in our actions, and in our deeds. And so David wanted everybody to know those who were loyal. Christ wants everyone to know those who were his. And he'll make that confession of us before the Father in heaven. And that means that we get to go and live with him forever. That's our our, our entrance, our key to heaven, that we are the mighty men and women, the mighty servants of Christ. So the question is, are you one of them? Are you one of the Lord's mighty men? Are you faithful in your service to him? Are you doing bold things for him? Are you doing exhausting things for him? The right things, humble things, difficult things, even extravagant things for him. That's what it takes to be a mighty servant of God. And that's what we need in the church, in our world, to set that kind of example, to take the truth into the world 
and uh, to help souls find the way of salvation. I hope that you're one of God's mighty men. I hope that you're serving him faithfully. And if not, I hope you'll think seriously about it. And if there's a change that needs to be made in your life, that you'll make that decision to turn your life over to him and extravagantly give to him everything that you are, everything that you have, simply because he deserves it. Paul wrote to the Corinthians to, to, about God. He said, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. It's unspeakable because of its extravagance. When it came time for God to pay a price for you and for me, he, he didn't find the lowest thing that he could. He, he didn't pick out a, a, a pretty good human being. He didn't even choose an angel, but he sent his only begotten son, and he allowed him to suffer the cruelest, most horrible death of all to pay the price for our sins. It's an unspeakable, extravagant gift. Will we give our extravagant gift to him by giving him our lives, our hearts, everything that we have? If you need to do that, you can become a Christian by obeying his gospel. Believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, confess his name, and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you've done that and haven't been faithful, need to come back home, repent of sin, confess it. We'll pray with you and for you. God will forgive and will restore. And we can begin again to give to the Lord all that he deserves, everything that we have, simply because he is worthy. If you need to do that, we encourage you to make the decision. Come and respond to our Lord's invitation. Do that even now as we stand and as we sing.